Welcome back to the show, everybody. We're so happy that Ian O'Connor, who's a big-time author, I mean, he doesn't even, like, look at us off the air. He's that big. He has made his way into the studio oh. to talk about his new Aaron Rodgers book, Out of the Darkness, and I read the whole thing. Darkness. And um, <laughs> I, I'll start off, Ian, first of all, thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. And the book, uh, you can get on Amazon now, goes on sale worldwide tomorrow. Correct. All right. Barnes and the whole deal. All right. Can I say something about this show first? Sure. Okay. Because this show has meant, obviously, a lot to me. I'm very happy you guys. I, I'm sad you're leaving the station. I'm very happy you're going to an iconic home. But, listen, I'm a four-time New York Times bestseller, in large part because of your show. So, right. really, two places, two juggernaut places, this show and Bookends in Ridgewood, which I'm, I'll be at Saturday at 1 o'clock. Cool. But they sold 1,500 of my four New York Times bestsellers out of that store. Wow. And you guys, I think, have probably sold more than that. I really believe, believe that. I think this show has done more for me than any show in getting those books on the list. And hopefully the same thing applies. Oh, that's oh, really that's cool. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad we could do it. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as the new Oprah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? You get yeah, a book. Yeah, close you enough, man. Yeah, everybody gets a book. All right. So I'm going to start off with what I texted you the other day. All the people you spoke to also mentioned our show in it too, which I like. Um, I did more I, than once, I think. Yeah, yeah, more than once. I don't. I like him less after reading the book. <laughs> I mean, He's he comes off that. as <laughs> as an incredible know-it-all. Now, I don't mind smart people. I mind people that are smart that tell you they're the smartest guy in the room. I get that sense from him just from this book. Are you hearing that from people that have read it, or are you hearing other things? I'm hearing more of the opposite, that they like him more. But that's And it's interesting. I never want to tell the reader what to feel about the subject. My job, I think, is to paint the full picture, and then you decide, and Don decides, and Peter decides. And he's a very polarizing guy, and the last three, four years, it's been all negative. And a lot of it has been self-generated, self-inflicted wounds, unforced errors. The funny thing is... When I first thought that this book would sell is off your show, your interview with him after his introductory press conference, which you guys raised. We loved him. Yeah. I mean, he was yeah. great. And he, was, he brought it. He knew that he had to bring it for you guys, and he did. And my wife, Tracy, you know her. She is not, she's a Mets fanatic, but she's not a football fan. She's driving around listening to your interview with him. She comes home, and she says, I could have listened to Aaron Rodgers talk for two hours. And when I heard a... A woman who's not a football fan say that I thought I think I have something here mm -hmm. and I think I do and that's totally fine if you like them less I would say seven out of ten people have told me they like them more who've read it. obviously not too many people have read it yet because it's officially out right. tomorrow but I yeah so that's fine I, I don't want to make that decision I want you to make that well, what did you like him more that to me is more important you spent time with them yeah how uh, did you feel I did. I didn't really. I, I didn't know him. I've never really met him. I've asked him questions in a few press conferences, and in part, he could have made my life a lot more difficult with this book, like Belichick did. Belichick not only didn't talk to me, and he didn't owe me anything, so I wasn't upset about it. But he so recruited people to not talk to me. <laughs> Aaron didn't do that, and also he sat down with me at the end of the process. So I have to admit, there's a little bias there that. The guy did actually help me, right, and right. he agreed to talk about things he doesn't talk about, his family estrangement, the mistake he made with COVID. He admitted that mistake. He's never admitted any mistake about anything. He's not a big I'm sorry guy. He's, he's, I don't think I've ever heard him say those words, but I, you would, I think, agree that most of the greats never say mm -hmm. because they feel they say they're sorry in another arena. They're bringing that weakness and fault into the competitive arena, and that's not a good thing. But I think I do like him a little Fearless public speaker, and on a certain level, I respect that a lot because I'm not. And he, I don't agree with a lot of what he says. Right. But he's been through a lot in his life, and he's been under under evaluated and misevaluated as a football player his entire career. And I think he brought that, and still has that. And I think that has led to some of this digging in against the media with, on some fronts that he shouldn't bother defending, but feels he has to. So I. Think I think I have a better understanding of him. He helped me with the book, and so I think I like him a little bit more. He's he's not really overly political in the sense of taking a side of red or blue, but it does feel the defenders of him or the haters of him are coming from that side. That's what I feel like. Like that interview you talked about when we, we had him on, 
I thought he was fairly neutral. He was fun. He was engaging. He came across as, as really a great guy. And really, for the most part, that whole season before he got hurt and all that, that he did, was saying all the right things. It wasn't mm -hmm. being over-controversial. I find the people that defend Rodgers defend him for two reasons. They defend him because they're a Jet fan and just want to win with him. Or they agree with what he says. And the people that don't like him are either not Jet fans or don't agree with what he says. Like, I don't even know if people have an opinion on him. I feel like people just have opinions on his opinions. <laughs> and if they agree with him, they're all for it. And if they don't, because he's so polarizing, because he doesn't, he definitely takes a side on everything. So I don't, really don't know how to feel about him because you can't get beyond the opinion. Yeah. And listen, if he wins big with the Jets, a lot of this is going away. You guys know how it works. Victory does not equal virtue, but a lot of times it gets confused with virtue. If he goes to the Super Bowl, gets to the AFC Championship game in Kansas City, and, and makes his team a winner, a lot of that stuff's going away. Sure. Now, if, if particularly if he wins a Super Bowl, which... It's improbable, but it's doable. Don, I don't know what you think. I, I actually think it probably would be bigger than Messier in 94, simply because the NFL is bigger. Yes. I think it would be the biggest New York sports story of our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I do want to cover that. I was four years old when the Jets won the Super Bowl, so I, I have flicker and black and white images of it on my uncle's TV. And I'm turning 60 in 10 days, and I want to see the Jets back in the Super Bowl. And this guy taking them there would wipe well, away a lot of on-field and off-field sin. And you okay. mentioned, well, because football's bigger than hockey, but, you know, Messier had the guarantee. Messier he had did. the hat against the Devils. Like, he really contributed. It's hard not to contribute as a quarterback. That's true. I guess he yeah. could win it the way Peyton Manning won in Denver, but I don't see that happening. I don't know if the Jets are that good beyond right. Rodgers for that to happen, but... I guess he would he would have to contribute in some way, but I can't imagine him not contributing as a quarterback of an NFL team to a championship. That's right. And Messier won those five in Edmonton, and it's funny today, people only talk about the sixth. Right. It's like those five almost didn't happen. And I think Aaron looks at Tom Brady. He's got seven. I've got one, and that's why he wanted to trade to the Jets. He saw a wonderful opportunity because I can't close that gap. I'm not winning six Super Bowls before I retire. But if I win one for a franchise that hasn't been in the Super Bowl since January. Of 69, it's going to feel like three rings. It's so true. And his legacy, I won one with an iconic Packers franchise, and I ended a biblical drought with the Jets in New York City. Man, that's going to explode. It's like the anti-Bucks one. Like, like the Bucks one, don't get me wrong, it's cool for Brady, especially given the whole Belichick story. But him going to Tampa and winning it with the kind of market that it is, it almost feels like half a Super Bowl <laughs> relative to Rodgers winning one in New York. And a big part of your book... And I'm glad it served this for me. I, I don't have the greatest memory of, like, minutia from... He's not that great in postseason games. I, no, I, I 11 mentioned, and 10. Yeah, 11 and 10. And he's never... I mean... On good teams. Yeah, I would say Rides and Mahomes are the two greatest physically, and then they're... But I'll push back a little bit on that. They win in, in 2010. In 2011, they're 15-1. and one. They're dominating the league. They should have two-peated that year. They lose to the Giants. I was there. And unfortunately, the offensive coordinator, Joe Philbin, his son drowned that week. And that really impacted that team in a profound way. And that's not talked about because it's, it's difficult to talk about something like that in football context. But... Going to football in 2013 through 2016, those are four opportunities he had. Special and magical ways in that situation in all four of those seasons, and it's just loss, 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 loss. And th that's what the box score says. But if you think about and go back and look at some of the moments he had in those four years, and, and you would ha have to say he's a player. And back I, to I, back I, Marys. I, I do yep. want I do want to push back against myself on this. I think. From this book, just reading the detail, Mike McCarthy did not do him any favors. Not a great coach. If he had Bill Belichick, as you mentioned in the book, he'd have six Super Bowls. I don't know if he'd have six. Chris Sims thinks he's he, he'd have eight. <laughs> I do think Tom Brady had an intangible that somehow uh, Rodgers didn't have. But physically, when you go back and look at tape of those games in his prime, he was so much better than Tom Brady physically. His teammates told me that, Ryan Grant and others. This is like, Brady, are you kidding me? Compared to Aaron Rodgers? Watch him play against Atlanta in the divisional round in the year he won the Super Bowl. It was 
ridiculous. You just can't play the position any better than that ever. And it's a shame. He's too good to retire with one ring. That's why I do hope it happens for the fatalistic Jet fan base, but also for him because he's worthy of that. And, and I do want to see that happen. So did we... Did we get anywhere with the family estrangement thing? <laughs> I mean, it seems like we know how his family feels, and the stuff you did on that is it's pretty remarkable. I mean, his family does seem obviously very hurt, mm -hmm. also very much willing to reconcile. Uh, we know that they sort of believe that this happened because of his relationship with Olivia Munn. But uh, where do you end up landing on the family estrangement? Well, uh -oh. I, ended, I ended up driving the parents uh, to the 9-11 game last September, and it was it was strange because they're estranged from him for going up on 10 years now, and I'm driving them to MetLife Stadium, and it's the only time they get to be in the same room with him is a football stadium. So do go to some games. They went to some home openers in Green Bay. It's their son, even though they don't speak. So, uh, and, and they told me that this is a testament to Jets fans, that after the injury, as heartbroken as they were for their flesh and blood, that that game and that crowd was so energized, and then, of course, the dramatic finish, that in the third quarter, they became Jets fans. They were wearing Jets gear. The, the people around them had no idea who they were, but they that night, they became Jets fans, and then I had to walk out to my car and drive them home. And I'm thinking, I had put this station on my radio and gave them the keys and so you can hear the post-game press conferences with your son and Robert Sala. I had no idea that his, their son would not give a post-game press conference because he was driven home by his friend Aubrey Marcus in the middle of the game. So uh, I go to the car, and I was really apprehensive. It was a strange drive home to Montclair. They, they had an Airbnb there because they wanted to run into Aaron. They didn't because uh, he lives a mile or two away from where they were staying. But that drive home was surreal. I, I became an Uber driver. I was not going to speak unless they spoke to me because they were sitting in their silence and their suffering. It was a tough night. Well, you know, wow. the, 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 I was really interested in that because I can't imagine, I can't imagine not talking to my parents. I mean, they're not here anymore. I wish I had the opportunity to talk to them more. Or he, your kids. Or my kids. Yeah. To completely shut off your family. And although you did exhaustive research and you talked to the parents, I still don't know what's wrong. The only thing I get is... And, and, and this is just, I'm surmising from the book, they are overly religious, and I think he's kind of over it. But that, uh, why, why cut your parents off by that? I don't know why he's not talking to them. Right, and I, I'm not sure he totally does either, and his parents aren't sure. And so family fractures, everybody wants a singular reason, a, a one defined reason or development or issue. And I thought I'd find that too when I started the research and talking to them, but it's very complicated. Religion was a part of it, or because he was raised devoutly religious mother. He mm -hmm. rebelled against that, and that did plant a seed for other rebellions. And Olivia Munn was part of it. She was not to blame completely, even though the parents believe she is. And uh, because Aaron carried some feelings into that relationship in 2014 that he already had, that his parents and his brothers were revolving too much around his fame and fortune and success. Right. And he was very generous with them. He didn't feel that was fully appreciated. She agreed with that. But he hasn't dated her in seven years, so how could he blame her? Yeah, right. He, he, there are petty issues with the brothers. He was really mad when Jordan went on The Bachelorette and used the estrangement to his advantage to pers uh, further his TV career. He was really yeah. pissed off about that. And they were, they were upset when he didn't go to a wedding and a funeral. And there are so many... Yeah. He didn't go to a funeral of his grandfather, who he was yeah. close with. He uh, he called his grandmother. It was the first time she had spoken to him in a while. He was very close to them. He used to call them before every game from high school, college, and, and the pros. And he did send her an email. I, I emailed back and forth with his grandmother, and she was very appreciative of that anyway. But, yeah, he... Uh, he really couldn't fully answer that question. His parents can't. So there are 14 or 15 different reasons, and a lot of them are minor. And so it adds up to an estrangement that should have been killed off five, six years ago. Did, I, did, I, you said he, he not a, does he, I mean, he can just tell you it's this. Did he just not want to tell you? Because he did speak to you at the end. He did, and he said there are a couple things I just don't want to talk about that are involved here uh, for public consumption. And okay, and, but I've talked to a lot of his friends who are close and have a handle on the situation. They agree with me. Jordan Russell, his best friend, told me the punishment does it fit the crime. Basically, it doesn't. And does Jordan know what it is? Because Jordan came back from Elba. 
Yeah. No, he's Jordan Russell, right? He was yeah. on the island. Yeah. Right? And Aaron, when he's excommunicating you, he puts you on this island, and it's a cold and lonely place. There's no FaceTime connection even. <laughs> and if you're a person who's not on the island, but you communicate with somebody on the island, then you're, on the you're island. the next person there. And so Jordan made it back, but he said, does the punishment really fit the crime? And he's his role, he said, as Aaron's best friend, is to try to make wow. this reconciliation happen. It, it's just amazing. Even when you put it in the words you did where... They were at an Airbnb in Montclair hoping to run into their son. Like, mm -hmm. that, that just, that's sad. Especially from somebody that, you know, I lost my dad when I was young. My mom's still with me. But I, it has to be something catastrophic that would make me not want to see my parents. Brothers, sisters, I get it. They squabble. They get in the fights. But, you know, these, these are your parents. It's got to be something. Big and I'm sorry, if it's not something big, then it's hard not to be judgmental, kind of against him. If it's something petty that you don't even want to see your parents. Well, it's, there's there's one hopeful scene in the book of Aaron hugging his dad last year at Lake Tahoe at the celebrity golf tournament. He plays in every summer, and actually, I'll be honest here, I've never really said this before, but. I was talking with Ed Rogers, his dad, in Chico, California, where Aaron grew up, and he was talking about how Aaron doesn't know how to end this. He, he just can't figure it out, which is true. It's a living organism, the estrangement, and he can't kill it off, so he's allowing it. Instead of confronting it, he's just allowing it to live on because he can't figure out how to end it. So he said he doesn't... Ed Rogers told me, Aaron doesn't know how to make the first move. So I said, well, why don't you make the first move? And he said, I think I will. So he goes to the golf tournament. He puts himself in the crowd in his line of vision. Oh, that's your conversation with him was before that. That's correct. Okay, well. Yeah, and I haven't said that before. Wow. I, I don't even remember if I put that in the book. You but, didn't. You didn't. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I just said, that's really all my contribution was because I didn't want to get involved. I just said, why don't you make the first move? So he said, okay, I will. And he goes to the golf tournament. Aaron, on the ninth hole on Saturday, sees him in the crowd. And he's thinking to himself, do I ignore him? Do I act like I'm on the phone or do I go give him a hug? He's my dad. So something compelled him to go over and give him a hug. Ed was looking at the ninth tee box. He turns around and Aaron's standing 15 feet away looking at him and Ed froze because he said, I just forgot what it felt like to have my son in my presence looking at me. So Aaron walks up to him, hugs him, says, I love you. Ed says, I love you, son. He cries. Uh, Aaron gathers himself. It was a 30-second thing, and then he had to go finish his golf round. But there was no follow-up. Uh, I did get both of them to say, particularly Aaron, and he has not said this about any family member since the estrangement started in 2014, I want a relationship with my father. So I do think it will happen. They're both on the record saying that. So I think it will happen, and then I think the rest of the family will sort of fall into place. Yeah, but what I don't understand, you know, your parents get older. Mm -hmm. you, you just can't wait. I mean, milk spoils. I mean, they might not be here, and then you're going to really be sorry. That you, well, what is he waiting for? Well, I mean, at, at the risk of doing what, what people already think we do anyway, which is beating up Aaron Rodgers on this show, it's, it, it kind of goes to show you that as intelligent as he is, and he is intelligent, I sort of feel like a really fundamental tenet of emotional intelligence is the ability to forgive and the ability to apologize and the ability to confront other adults about things that are important to you and that just seems to be a thing that he struggles with which kind of does add to the complexity and fascination with the guy now talking about being smart right he was just on with barton Hahn, and i was listening driving in and in the book you you say he's really smart about things he reads everything and they're talking about the olympics and alan Hahn said you know we got our butts kicked in three on three basketball and like this, he goes, well, you know, Jimmer Fredette got hurt. Who would know that <laughs> no, Jimmer no, Fredette no. got hurt? I, I, I did. You, he, it's a trick. It's a trick. That, that was around. There was a big social media clip moving around because Jimmer Fredette oh, got that's hurt. Right. I saw that. And yeah. there was, and the there was a woman who was doing the physical like therapy on him on the bench and was like rubbing this, his thigh. But this guy knows everything <laughs> about everything. Yeah, no, no. I think. I mean, for him to like throw well, Jimmer I Fredette think, no, instantaneously. Out of yeah. I, I think before his interview with you last year after the press conference. Gelfand or somebody said, hey, Aaron, this is a big show, okay? And I think he knew that, and he went in and gave you the best interview of the day. I heard all of them by far. And so he's smart that way. He knows what matters and what doesn't. As far as the, the family goes, uh, there are family members who told me they think if he had his own family, if he had kids. I, I thought the exact same thing. Will he uh, figure it out when he has kids? Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to sound like J.D. Vance here. And we're talking about kids and not right. having kids. and, But he wants to have kids. And I do think he'll be like Jeter where he m marries late and 
and has kids late, but uh, he really wants to have kids. He said, that's the next stage for me, and I actually think I saw him, and I've talked to his friends. Who, he's great with kids. He is really good with kids, so I think he'll be a really good father. And then maybe you'd have to think that once he feels that love for a child, he'll go, oh, my God, what I would do if this child stopped talking to me. Exactly. You know, and that will exactly. then affect the way he sees his parents. You think he's going to have a good year this year? I do. I think he's going to have a big year. I think he'll make 14 starts. I think Tyrod Taylor will go 2-1 and one in the other three. Just have the injury in the middle of the year so he's healthy for the playoffs. Yeah, I think they're an 11-6 and six team. They should win the division, and I think they can make a run. Oh, yeah, that would be, that'll be so cool, man. It is, it is a shame for Aaron that it's all about the Super Bowl because even if everything clicks, it's such a difficult conference. It's just so hard to win. There, there's no reason the Chiefs can't the, repeat the, this the, year. There's, got, there's yeah. got to be some happy medium. Or Michael doesn't think so, but is there something that they could do where you still will feel it was worth it even if they don't have a ring? Yes. Yeah, if, if they go 11-6, and six, make the play. If they make the playoffs and they win a playoff game, I have them, somebody asked me the other day, I have them 11-6 and six and losing the AFC Championship game at Kansas City. To me, that's a win. You can, that can't be a shame, right? No, like he, no, they, unless he throws four picks and gives them no chance. Even if I mean, he does, he gets them to the Final Four. And, and you lose to the greatest, one of the greatest teams we've ever seen. That's right. Is he jealous of Mahomes? That's a good question. I don't know, because Mahomes replaced him as a spokesperson with State Farm, yeah. too. They decided, let's go with the controversy-free, Jeter-like guy in Mahomes, and Aaron's getting older, and we have all these controversies. So that was a nice little transition as far as uh, spokespeople are concerned. But Mahomes, I don't know. I did not ask him that question. All right, we're going to – can you stay with us? Absolutely. All right, so Ian O'Connor, who has a great what, book two coming segments? out tomorrow. You see, no, no, we're, we we're going for three. You want to go three? <laughs> yeah. That's how we feel about this? I yeah. thought it was four. Wow. wow. He, he's almost like a family member. I, I, I love the man. Out of the Darkness, uh, the book about Aaron Rodgers, it's great. It's tremendous. And it, it brings you into the soul, I think, and the mind of a very complicated individual. So we'll uh, we'll talk to uh, Ian a little bit more when we come back. But first, Peter's going to tell us about FanDuel. Oh, you're right.